Welcome everyone, this is Singularity Hub and we are live at Singularity University's Global Summit here in San Francisco, coming to you for three days straight. I'm Allison Berman, I'm a staff writer. Hey, I'm Pascal Finette, I'm the Vice President of the Startup Solutions here at Singularity University. Okay, so Pascal, what is going on at the summit? Well, Summit is this crazy three-day gathering we have where we bring truly the best we have to show on our stages, in, workout, uh, in workshops, and behind us in this innovation um, hub here as well. Totally. Yeah. And I think one of the most exciting things about this summit particularly is that, you know, it's San Francisco, so it's not the heart of Silicon Valley. We're a little removed. But we bring together all these fascinating, uncommon partners. We have startup entrepreneurs here. We have really senior executives, CEOs, government people. It's... It's cool. And then just an incredible amount of people on our stages, right? Not just the people you typically see at Singularity University. Mm -hmm. What I'm super excited about is we have all these people you typically don't see at Singularity University who are kind of fit into our ecosystem. Yeah, and it kind of it brings people in. And then the exciting part to me is that afterwards, like startups might be founded, new business ideas. I think that's the really the magic. I already had this. So we started off the day with um, our alumni gathering. So we've got hundreds, literally hundreds of our alumni coming from all over the world, coming together. And uh, I was on stage for like, you know, 10 minutes. We did this quick Q&A thing. And afterwards, like, I already had like five alumni coming to me. It's like, oh, we want to do this business with you. And it's like, it's crazy. The energy is so like positive and it's just buzzing. Yeah. We have a lot of energy. So everyone watching, we hope you do too. Yeah. <laughs> so of all the different technologies that are being shown here, is there one that you're excited about? I know for me personally, I am, there's so much hype in the area about artificial intelligence, but we have a lot of companies here with real applications of artificial intelligence systems. So I'm really curious to hear more of the nitty gritty. Absolutely. I think what's really fascinating is, um, and I know you're doing a segment where you walk around and show the audience some of our companies yeah. here. What I find so fascinating is like the, the applications, mm -hmm. right? So like really bringing it down to like, okay, so you use this AI thing, but you do something very useful with it. And yeah. I know a lot of the guests we're going to interview over the next three days are actually working in this space. So I'm just so um, enthusiastic about hearing what they're doing with AI. Yeah, and so I want to talk about impact a little bit. So here, everything we do is supposed to cause a positive impact in the world. And we have booths about companies focused on shelter, water, um, security. How you work in our startup lab, what is the challenge that some startups have as they're like trying to get into these areas and focus in on solving a challenge? Like is picking the challenge difficult initially or? Well, I think they come, typically you come like uh, with, a, with a deep passion about your, about your problem space, which Peter Diamandis, whom I know you're going to interview today, yes. um, is, you know, is this one point, it's like, you know, find your passion and follow it. Yeah. I think the real interesting and the real hard challenge is that these problems are big and it takes time to solve them. Mm -hmm. So the gestation period for these startups is just longer. Um, funding can be harder because it's not, you know, like your average mobile phone app thing, which you can build in like three months, right? So um, we here at Singularity University have built a whole bunch of programs to support these, um, these startups and I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon those over the next three days as well. Yeah. One um, startup I know you're interviewing, Abby, I think tomorrow, with uh, Impact Vision. I think that technology is so interesting. They're using hyperspectral imaging to be able to see food quality and eliminate food waste. I think I really love when I see technology that feels applicable now. I think it can be a bit enchanting to want to be looking really big picture and look into the future. But when I think of something now, an app that helps you scan an avocado and people in large grocery stores ensure that they're not wasting so much food, that feels really tangible and meaningful. Absolutely. On that note, if I flip it around, I'm just really curious, like if you are taking like technology like into the far future, mm -hmm. like what is the stuff which really like breaks your brain? The stuff that breaks my brain, maybe the stuff that would potentially go inside of our brains. <laughs> so when people talk about, what is it, Neuralink, um, having a, um, chips implanted in their arms, all things that augment us, cyborg technology, that stuff honestly freaks me out. I write about it sometimes, I cover talks on it, but I don't really know, like, do I believe in changing our basic human nature? No, I don't think I do. So it's, it's really interesting for me to explore that stuff, but that stuff blows my mind because I can't really imagine a day where 
we are physically augmented, where our minds are physically augmented, um, our commutes are physically are augmented by technology. I just can't really imagine that type of a world. Even um, though we talk about it casually here, totally. I think about it and I think, could that really be 2025? But aren't we doing this today? I mean, aren't you like augmenting your mind today by using your phone and looking everything up on Wikipedia? I mean, the other day I was at a dinner conversation, right? And we had this, this thing where we talked about like movie references, right? Yeah. And literally every second reference, someone was like pulling out their phone, right? And it's like looking up, right? We already, I think, in a, in a, in a really weird, real way, we're mm -hmm. augmenting ourselves. And then you see yeah. like amputees running around with, you know, like, um, uh, like synthetic lab uh, limbs yeah. who are like connected to the nervous, actual nervous system, right? So it's a really fascinating. We're like, it yeah. feels like we're at the brink of it, right? So what's interesting is I think you just touched on two fascinating distinctions. For me, there is the really meaningful applications of technology to people. If you are missing a limb and there's like a 3D printed solution to having one created for you, that's amazing. So that's you know concrete, really making someone's life better. Then I view the kind of superfluous technical applications and when people talk about, you know, so Google helps us augment our minds, sure. But when that's inside of us, is that needed? Do we really need that? You don't want to have Google search inside of your brain? No, because as you do every <laughs> Google search, they're also tracking all of your data, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I don't want my thought process tracked. Plus, you get a whole bunch of nice ads. That would be great. We're like having this conversation right, right now, and Google's like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> totally. All right. Yeah. So um, I think we are exploring more of this stuff. Um, as we go through the next couple of days. We and, definitely are. Right? On the big stages, we're going to talk a lot about this stuff. Um, I'm curious, like, you have been to the summit last year. Yeah. I actually couldn't come because I was so dead after our global solutions program that I couldn't yeah. get out of bed for like a week. Which is, that's our 10 week uh, program with young entrepreneurs where they all at the end launch their own startup. Exactly. And by the way, we just came off of that. Yes. Um, so, so you're probably tired now. I'm super tired. <laughs> And if you hear my, my voice being a little hoarse, like that's definitely uh, yeah. a direct uh, connection I'll to that program. I'll do the screaming. Yeah. Uh, but you're asking me about last year. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So when you look at last year and you compare it to this year, like mm -hmm. what do you think has changed? What do I think has changed with the conference or subject mm -hmm. matter? The conference, so we have a really focused alumni track. So people who have been here before or have gone to our programs can go into a deep dive about artificial intelligence, robotics. They can have, instead of a 101, they can go into a 201. So that's one unique thing. I think the focus on impact feels stronger. In here we have these setups like food is here, the environment, energy. You know, These are the global grand challenges we're trying to solve and it's cool to see the global grand challenge and then the startups all around them. I love that. Um, in terms of the content, there's a panel working in media I'm really excited about, which is uh, with Craig Newmark, mm. uh, founder of Craigslist, and it's about the future of media and news. That, I don't think we had such a focus on that last time, and I think what I love about that is that with the recent election and presidency and all of this and the big talk of fake news, technology can be something that spreads fake news much more rapidly and that exploits um, filter bubbles and all of that, but technology can also be a thing that buffers it and helps us um, stop fake news. So I'm very excited for that discussion because I think um, it speaks to the idea of responsibility and behind every technology here is the idea that we need to be responsible in how we're developing it. It's interesting. I, uh, uh, As you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm just coming back from the closing ceremony of our Global Solutions Program, which mm -hmm. was Friday. And we had uh, Mitchell Baker, the chairwoman of the Mozilla Foundation, uh, was a guest. And we talked about um, a little bit about like, what's happening in news. Mm -hmm. And uh, a phrase she used, and I think uh, it's not a direct quote, but she said something uh, to the tune of, probably the internet has lost its innocence. Right? Mm -hmm. With, like, we are now seeing you know, like, spam bots coming around, uh, you yeah. know, like Twitter accounts being flooded by spam bots, like news being shifted. And you might have seen, like, now we can't even trust the, uh, the filmed view anymore, where these yes. experiments were, came out where, like, mm -hmm. someone took Obama's face, basically, right, right and we made him say something. It was, yeah. Exactly, it was an article on, on HUB, which is crazy. So, yeah, really, really interesting discussion. And I know you're going to interview, uh, interview uh, Craig, right? I am, tomorrow at, I believe, 5 p.m. And so I think, yeah, this, I think the theme of responsibility is going to be everywhere for the next three days. I don't think that we as a company can do our job without talking about responsibility and ethics. So 
I'm psyched for that across all technology disciplines. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Okay, well, we are wrapping now. Pascal's about to have some really exciting interviews. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, welcome back to Singularity University. Um, from cell phones to washing machines to your toaster, the internet of anything, the in internet of, some people call it the internet of shit, um, is truly here. And I couldn't be happier to uh, have a very special guest today, uh, Andreas Gall, former CTO at Mozilla, today the founder and CEO of Silk Labs, where you apply artificial intelligence to this, this vast area of IoT. Andreas, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. What does Silk Lab do? Okay, yeah, first of all, great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And I think you've summarized it very well. We are trying to bring the latest advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence to this new domain of, of connected devices. And we think it's really not connectivity, but it's the intelligence of the devices that drives a really good experience. And in our opinion, it's also much of what has been going wrong the last couple of years in this domain. Is the, these devices feel like shit because they're not really intelligent. They're just merely connected. And the real value and the real user experience really arises once these devices start to understand what humans want from them. Can you give us a, a, a bit more of an, a, a concrete example how this is play out in my life? I mean, I've got a, you know, I've got an Alexa at home, I've got a Google Home yeah. at home, and they kind of feel like, okay, and it's like a magical experience to walk into my home and it's like, Google, switch on the lights, you know, instead of like using the light switch. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, before we talk about the really complicated use cases, let's just maybe just talk about the really basic ones if you're not satisfying today, right? So I, I can tell you how I got started with this mm. company. Uh, this was really on the technical side, I started like, getting into more in the AI field, and this is something I studied uh, 15 years ago, which in this entire field was in a very different phase of evolution. Many things that are today very simple, they're not possible. So there was a big technology shift happening, and I started to think about how this could affect products. And uh, if you look at the connected devices space, two years ago, but this pretty much applies today as well, much of the experiences are really underwhelming. Mm -hmm. Concretely, the product that got me going with this company was Dropcam. Hmm. I really bought into Dropcam's sales pitch is that always know what happens in your house when you're not home. Yeah. That is fantastic. That is a problem that I have. Totally. Wondering what's happening in my house when I'm at work. But uh, when you actually like, live that experience they're offering you then and also today, it's extremely underwhelming. Because hmm. you buy this camera and every time I come home, I get a notification that I have come home or there was motion in my house. Every time my dog is jumping or a curtain is moving, I get a notification. That is completely useless and you switch it off and all of a sudden the premise they promised you is not really being fulfilled anymore. So I was very curious, what is the cause for that and how can we use AI to improve that? Now if you go a step further, what is really the experience I would like to have? 
Of course, well, if there's a stranger in my house, I would like to know that. If I come home, don't tell me, I already know that. It's me coming right. home. So this ability to basically take the next step of intelligence and for machines to understand context, and understand who is at home, what are, why are they at home, what are they doing, I think that's where many of these really interesting experiences start getting unlocked. So for example, with the light example, I'm not sure I want to come home at night when it's dark in my house and tell my house to turn on the light. This is pretty obvious what I need in that moment. So I really want my environment to figure this out on its own. So that requires to a lot of, large extent that, that all these devices start talking to each other, which I think is one of the big inhibitors today, right? I've got like all these de connected devices and mostly they don't talk to each other or talk to each other in very basic ways. And I know, you know, we share history with Mozilla yeah. where we built the web, uh, which is all about interconnectedness. Where do you see this going? Because there doesn't seem to be like a, a common language for these devices yeah. at the moment, right? I think it's a really good point. And I think there's a lot in the history of the web that we can use to learn here. If you think back, the web wasn't really uh, solved and evolved into what it is today by sitting down and doing a grand committee of plans and like, coming up with this like 10-year plan of technology and then implementing that. It was really just like people were adding random pieces to the web and mm -hmm. some piece of it worked, others didn't. Multiple companies evolved the web and then at some point after the fact they would get together and try to kind of harmonize these standards a little bit. I think that's a very powerful approach and I think that's really what will happen in the IoT space as well is that we have to focus first on really good experiences and great products that we solve real problems. And once you have two devices that solve real problems for you, then we can find a way how they work together and do this even better. If you start the other way around by gathering a large committee of people and come up with some standards, there's five or six of them already. And nobody's really using them because it's very hard to take the first step. Gotcha. So what is your, uh, in your case, like what is the linchpin? The linchpin for us really is that, in our opinion, the, the value of IoT is not really in making things connected. So in case of Dropcam, for example, you took a camera and you connected it to the internet. That's a good first step, but that's not really where the core premise is. The core premise is to knowing, not seeing. Gotcha. And I think this is one of the, the big mistakes that a lot of IoT device manufacturers are making is that they're going to slap connectivity onto a device and I have a connected toaster. Right. And it's just, just, as, just as bad or worse than an right. actual toaster. Right. So it's really around bringing intelligence to these devices. And that's what we are focused on. So what Silk absolutely is specialized in, we are bringing the latest advances in AI technology directly into these devices. And there's a lot of privacy, but also usability benefits if the intelligence comes to the edge mm. versus trying to put all of these intelligence functionality into the cloud. How do you deal with, I mean, we all know, here, particularly here at Singularity University, Moore's Law, right? So there will be more and more compute power at like lower and lower prices. But it feels to me like um, to do this effectively, like you would need to put quite a bit of compute power at the edges of the network, right? Is that really feasible today? So that's a great question, and here is where we are finding us, ourselves today in a very unusual situation of, of technology evolution where hardware has slapped software. Mm -hmm. Traditionally in computing and, and, and compute-based devices, there's always like really uh, advanced software that suffers from hardware not being fast enough. If you remember like smartphone evolution, for example, in the beginning, a lot of limitations on, on, on smartphones were really based on not enough compute or not enough battery life and the mm -hmm. hardware to catch up mm -hmm. with the capabilities of the software. And in the IoT space, we find ourselves in an opposite situation where we have gone through 10 years of evolution of the smartphone supply chain. And the same components that are in a smartphone are going to these connected devices, which means that they are incredibly power be powerful. These smartphones that we are carrying in our pockets today, they're basically little supercomputers. Yeah. They, have, they have the amount of computer, supercomputer at 20, 25 years ago. So we have massive compute, and it's very, very cheap. You can go to India and you can buy an entry-level smartphone for 25 US, 25 US dollars. Mm. So the components inside of it are very available, they're very cheap, they're very powerful, and we have no software to take mm. advantage of it in IoT space. That's really exactly what we are focused on, helping companies to take advantage of the existing hardware and add the missing software, especially around intelligence and AI, to make that into really interesting device experiences. Interesting. Let me geek out for one second. Okay. Because I, I mean, we, had a, we have like, shared history on like, building like, interesting stuff together. Um, do you think this requires also probably, what, new programming languages, programming paradigms, or is the existing stack we have today uh, usable? One of the particular reasons which I always find so curious is a lot of people who work in IoT, I find, they're writing their stuff in C, which is like, I get it, it's like low-level, machine-level stuff, right? And you get the performance, but it feels pretty archaic. I think there's two large trends here that are worth talking about separately. 
The, the first is really around what you brought up around programming languages, so just like software engineering in general in this mm -hmm. domain. And I think it's a very valid point. It's something that we are trying to address as well. So in addition to our intelligence stack, we also offer a software stack, a general kind of software updates, software evolution, um, basically a software framework that tries to advance the state of the art in the way we make software for devices. Traditionally, this was firmware engineering, mm -hmm. where a bunch of people sit down in the basement and write a firmware, and then it's a golden master, and you burn it in there, and then you never touch it again. And in these very live device experiences, it's not really possible to create the kind of high quality, constantly evolving experience with this kind of old school 30 year old firm firmware thinking. You have to go about the device software much more like a smartphone application where you constantly measure what the device sees, constantly improve it. So there's definitely a big shift happening on the technology side where we're moving away from C and like firmware and like linking firmware images and so on. We're going to modern software environments. We're using a lot of JavaScript based software environments. Uh, and, and engineering tools and methods and making devices with our stack feels a lot more like developing a web service mm -hmm. than a traditional device. But there's actually underneath an even larger trend. This was one of my personal motivations to kind of switch gears and go from being a chief technology officer of a company that makes like algorithms and technology and, and presents for the web to a company that really mostly deals with data. And that's the, the fundamental observation that AI will really, at a, at a very fundamental level, change the way we build products. Mm. In the past, my profession, I'm a software engineer by trade, uh, my job was really to come up with clever algorithms to solve concrete computational problems. Right. And machine learning completely disrupts this because all of a sudden you take a general neural network engine, and there's a few of them, there's TensorFlow and there's others, but there's a very small number of them. Uh, and there's, there's not a lot of differentiation you can get from a different engine. And all you need is domain specific data, and lots of it, and data scientists, mm -hmm. and you can solve a wide range of diverse problems, mm -hmm. although all of a sudden, my job, software engineer, is a lot less important. It's all about data so and, and, and data sciences. So it's fascinating. So do you think, on a macro trend, do you think that we are seeing a shift away from like people going into software engineering and more into the data science? So Absolutely. is the job of the future the data scientist versus the software engineer? Absolutely. I think that huh. I firmly believe long term software engineering is really going to be de-emphasized as, as kind of the, the crown jewel of making especially software based products. The last 20 years software engineers were basically fairly high up in a decision making process because we had so much influence how software experiences turn out. This will change. It will be much about data scientists and how to understand data and how to form these neural networks. There's really a big shift happening. Mm -hmm. Now it's important, this is a long term trend, right? Yeah. I guess I think it's comparable to like self driving cars. Yeah. Like yes, I would not if today you can still get a driver license, it will still be useful to you for, for many years. But in a long term trend at some point hmm. you probably want to think about a different long term career than a driver. So I think Same. it's a little bit similar with software engineer. I'm not discouraging people to go to school right now to learn how to program. <laughs> right. But over a 10, 20 year time frame, we will see a lot more emphasis being put on data sciences, and understanding how to use data to train neural networks to solve problems, yeah. and sort of use software engineering manual skills to design algorithms to solve similar problems. Do you think that also will lead to a, a world where we probably have more people being makers again? I think the web did a great job at like, you know, it's fairly simple for someone to put up a website and then the web became pretty complex, right? Like you had suddenly like the explosion of JavaScript stacks and like, you know, back end, front end and, you know, middleware, yeah. et cetera. And it became really complex and the, the, the tool chain to build a modern web application is pretty complex today, right? And it requires actual knowledge, real deep knowledge. Do you think we're getting in the space you're in, like to a world where people become more tinkerers again? I think there's, there's a couple aspects of uh, the evolution we are seeing right now that will help that and then a couple that will hurt that. Mm. And the ones that, it's worth talking about the ones that are hurting this as well because this might be where, where certain organizations or even governments could step in and help, help that to a degree. On the one hand, there's a big democratization happening right now because the technology itself in this space is often pretty openly available. So this, this goes to the neural network engines such as TensorFlow, but even the, the model architectures like how to detect a face for example, these kind of things that like Google and a Facebook and a Baidu tend to open source the model framework itself. Mm -hmm. So this in general makes it a pretty even playing field. Anyone can go and take these technology. There's also very few patents in this space actually because it's mostly academically driven. So that's great. That means in, in fundamentally tinkerers can take this stuff and do things with it. On the flip side, much of the complexity of training these models is how much data you have available. And there's a few companies that have a huge head start in this kind of data. Like Google has, for example, tons of data about internet and like knowledge graph. Amazon have a ton of data on voice because they have been starting voice-based 
products uh, earlier than others. So uh, Facebook has a lot of facial data, so they can train great facial recognition models. And this is something where the general population is very much at a disadvantage for these big companies. And Silk Labs, around, uh, amongst others, is trying to equalize some of this disadvantage. We work with many hardware manufacturers. And we work with them together to collect the necessary data that we can create these models for them that are being used across an entire industry. So we're trying to make sure that models like this are not monopolized to a few uh, companies here in, here in Silicon Valley. Fascinating. Let me, in our last two minutes, let me uh, shift the conversation a tiny bit. I'm curious, like you've been in technology forever. You got a really deep background in technology. Um, what are you most excited about about the future outside of your field? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, that I find very exciting right now about just the way uh, technology itself is evolving is that the, the most powerful applications of technology have now left the direct technology sector. We're seeing especially software technology, but to a large degree also hardware technology, really transcend software engineering in Silicon Valley and the, the coolest companies that solve the coolest problems are no longer narrowly speaking like technology companies, right? This goes from every form of a Lyft and an Uber yeah. that transports you somewhere. Yes, there's technology involved, but at the end of the day, first of all, it's, it's a magical experience. It's the closest we have gotten so far to the Star Trek transporter. You step outside a building, get out your sure. phone and push a button, and half yeah. an hour later you show up <laughs> in a different place. It's, it's magic, right? And technology is involved, but really in a secondary role. It's really, it transforms the way people interact and with each other and makes new experiences possible. But also, if you think about agriculture, like I, I, I started... Uh, helping a company that does indoor agriculture using big data to kind of see how you can improve the efficiency of agriculture. So here's technology making agriculture better. So I think this is very exciting for me as a technologist is that I can, I can see what we have done the last 20, 30 years in technology, what we have learned, really impact broadly the field around the narrow technology sector. That's fantastic. I think on that note, um, and with such a positive outlook onto the future, uh, I want to call it a wrap. Andreas, thank you so much for being here. I'm here at Singularity Hub at the Singularity Global Summit. It was so much fun geeking out with you for a little bit and being reconnected. And um, I, I expect great things from Silk Labs in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're back from the show floor here at the uh, Singularity University Global Summit for Segna. I just lost my train of thought because I'm so excited to have our next guest here. Um, Andy Billings, who is the head of uh, profitable creativity, which we will dig deep into what that actually means at one of the world's largest gaming companies, also one of the, I think, oldest gaming companies around, Electronic Arts. Uh, Andy, I'm super stoked to have you here. 
It's good to see you, Pascal. Thank you. I uh, also just want to uh, mention this, honorable mention, um, you're one of our star mentors in our oh, Singularity University uh, startup programs. Um, Andy, you've got the most curious title I've ever seen. When, when we met, like, got your business card and said, you know, uh, at the time I think it was VP, Profitable Creativity or something. What is this? What do you describe by that? Pascal, I've got one of the greatest jobs there at Electronic Arts. It's the intersection of creativity, making the world's most amazing games, and keeping people in that creative space to make those amazing games, and running it as a successful business. So it's, it's getting creatives to understand how to be good business people, and they can, and it's helping business people understand how to support and encourage creatives. So it's the, how do we make great games and how do we get people in the right space to do that. So I'm really curious, let me uh, say, you know, I grew up on electronic arts games. I mean... Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is what my, my childhood, right? And this company has been going strong for how long now? Like 30 plus years? Yeah, um, approaching 40 years. 40 years. So 40 years in an industry which is incredibly driven by creativity at the extreme edge of it, right? Like gaming to a very large extent for, for the last 40 years has pushed creativity. How do you keep people in that space? How do you keep them like, how do you keep them creative? It's a good question. Maybe I talk about, uh, maybe say it in, like in three areas. Sure. Um, I think things that we do to be innovative and creative are to always keep people uh, being empathic with our players. Second thing would be always interactive in the design of our games, interactive with our players. And then thirdly, just to be deeply curious all the time about what we're doing and what's happening with our players. And you know, if it's okay with you, maybe I'll just explain one game. Please, and, absolutely. And go from there. To, so yeah. uh, we're making Star Wars games. We're very excited about that. So on the, the empathy part, we, we no longer think about classic demographic characteristics of people as their segments or their, the target. We think about what motivates them, what's fun to them, and we now kind of develop the whole taxonomy of different reasons that people play games, like you might want to compete, I might want to design something, someone else might want to um, tell a story. And so we have, have much more insight into what makes people interested in playing games, and then we spend a lot of time with those players. So to be empathic now, we bring the players into the company, and we ask them all about Star Wars and what's interested and we understand what motivates them to play. And then we also go to their own living room or their study and we find out, you know, how are they playing those games. So um, we've now got a group of people that are helping us. Uh, right now about 500 people are helping us get a game out in Stockholm and they're, they're giving us ideas and, and improving. So that's, that's kind of the empathy part. Do you think you can... So... One step back, we just had Andreas Gall here, um, who's an incredible coder, and um, uh, Andreas and I have shared history working together. And at a lot Mozilla. Of, right. At Mozilla, right. And a lot of coders are not particularly, not a lot, let me rephrase this. Some coders are not particularly empathetic, right? They're, they're like very nerdy, like sitting in front of their computers, and they're, they're masters of it. Can you get these people to be empathetic? Yeah, good question. So. People that come to work for Electronic Arts as coders are there, are there to unite the world. So they're, they're there on a mission, and when we bring players in, young, old, different kinds of things, they get to see who they are creating games for, and they hear those people get so excited and so passionate about those games that they're just wired for weeks after those visits. Just amazing. Wow. Our problem is actually to calm them down and, and not go so wide rather than to, to rev them up. Interesting. Um, I think there's a, it feels to me there's a correlation to design thinking, which is this like, you know, it was a buzzword 15-ish years ago. I remember going to the D school, Stanford D school, uh, where they taught this. Um, it now feels to be like a very strong business paradigm, which a lot of like organizations um, uh, use to their advantage. Right. Uh, where do you see the overlap and where is it different? Well, we're still really deep into that design thinking. So for us, it's being interactive in the design process. We have all this empathy and all these insights with the with players. Mm -hmm. We used to call them customers, Pascal. Sorry to uh, say that. Now we call them players. Interesting. Completely different um, think about them. Yeah. We, we try and be interactive with them throughout the design process. So we have a group of people on the Star Wars game. We call them game changers. 
they're deep Star Wars fans and they're deep gamers, there are about a hundred of them and they spend an unhealthy amount of time every week playing the builds of the game, giving us feedback and giving us uh, feedback, you know, feedback ideas, tuning, polishing. It sounds like a dream job for some, I tell you that. They do this, they compete for the opportunity to do this on their own time. Oh, bad. So I bet, it's, I can it's, see it's, that. It's amazing. So the, the, um, to your question, though, they don't necessarily bring the innovation that's going to make that a hit game. Yeah. They can bring ideas and they can respond to what we do, but we still have to come out with a, you know, some blockbuster ideas that will make, it a, sure. will, will make it a hit. How do you marry um, like the, the, creati the creative side and the business side? Because your thing is like profitable creativity, right? Like how do you, I understand how you do it on a company side, but how do you do this with like the individual? So we play a lot of uh, games uh, around making games and creativity and business models and our, our game makers, our creatives, see them as games. They don't see them as learning business, they just see them as one other algorithm, one other um, piece of code that they're, they're learning. And so they understand, I need to hit games which will pull in players and make them stick and so forth. And they also understand, I have certain metrics, certain dials that are my profitability dials, and I need to, uh, I need to get them up as well. So you're turning let me see if I get this right. You're turning your business into a game. Business into a game. And That's we, amazing. And a, and a game in the sense that um, there are no immediate bad consequences. I mean, we have, that's the real business, but right. we, we step aside from that and we have environments in which people will simulate their games and simulate their live services with kind of, kind of real to life kinds of data and they get the experience of how, what it's like to run the business. And that's how we help our creatives especially see what are the decisions that they make and then what are the consequences. But they're still in that play environment, yeah. so they're, they're actually not harming. The CFO doesn't get excited when we play these games. <laughs> I bet. That's really fascinating. Do you think this would translate into other businesses? Like, if you were to take this out of the context of EA being a gaming company and c clearly your DNA is around this, if you were to take this into like a, a more traditional business, do you think this would work? Pascal, here's what I think is the translation piece, and that's what I would call playful, or, or, or having fun, which is you've suspended just a tiny bit of reality, you're just focusing on a few set of parameters, a few variables, um, you know what kind of the win state is, and you're just having fun. You're just, um, and if people are laughing, whatever environment it is, whether that's pharmaceuticals or manufacturing, if people have that kind of I'm having fun, I'm experimenting, I'm laughing. Uh, I, I think they'll be learning. Interesting. You should start EA Academy. You know, like Disney runs, uh, I forgot right, what the yes. name is, but Disney Academy, I think it is actually, where they teach the Disney way of thinking, right? I mean, there's something really interesting in there which, which deeply resonates with me, with, with uh, particular games becoming more fascinatingly, on one hand, more professionally, like really like people spending hours and hours and hours, way more than I did as a child. And then on the other hand, you've got the whole casual gaming, right? So right, right. gaming becomes this universal language somehow, right, for, for people. Yeah, so that's where we're really excited. I mean, some people say, well, maybe gaming has reached its peak, but I actually mm. think maybe we're just on the doorstep of what it really could be, because there are many, many players today right. for whom learning to play a game is too hard. Right. The consoles, are too, uh, the controls are too hard, the, the constraints are too hard, and we just yeah. need to figure out how to make you know, a fun, playful environment, which doesn't, which very easy to learn to play, and with AR, VR, yeah. other kinds of ways of, of putting in your ideas, you know, by voice or by gesture, all kinds of people are going to be able to play games that didn't want to spend the time to learn the controls. Yeah, right. I think that fits, of course, nicely in the stuff we're doing, we're showcasing here at the Global Summit, like all the, the new technologies coming up and right. enabling this. Let me take one step uh, back into the earlier part of the conversation. Um, I asked you if you think we can become empathetic. Do you think we can become inno innovative? Can we teach being innovative? Yeah. Pascal, you weren't supposed to ask me any really hard questions. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know if you can teach innovation, but I know that you can teach leaders how to create the environment in which innovation will come out of people. So I think there's a zone between complacency or too comfortable 
maybe that's sitting on a couch on a Sunday afternoon, kind of zoned out. And the other end of the zone is, you know, maybe it's too much pressure, or I'm threatened in some way, I don't feel safe in some way. So in between that complacency and threat is a very narrow zone of uh, safety or security, or it's a, it's a beautiful zone for being creative. And if people are creative, enough ideas will come out that some of them will, will be applicable to your business and we'll call those innovations. So I think you can help leaders learn to gauge, is, is my team in the zone? Yeah. And if not, what do I need to do as a leader to either ramp up the pressure or to ratchet it down and try and get them in that zone? So that, with practice, I think you as a leader will get to know and you'll have some practices around how to do that. So you work with a lot of leaders, both inside your organization as well as with your volunteering work, um, for it's example, at Singularity At Singularity, right. I'm curious, is there, is there a particular quality or skill you would identify which is necessary for the leader, particularly in these weird, excel exponentially accelerating times? Yeah, maybe it's that third idea around just always being curious. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're curious, you're not blocking and stopping and preventing new ideas or new technology from coming, you're kind of embracing them. So if you can always just uh, get yourself in that curious zone around, gee, I wonder what that means, and then mistakes, setbacks, problems don't feel like they're, they're devastating, they feel like you know, more data yeah. coming in. Do you think it's something people have? Like, it's something which is like socialization, genetics, whatever, karma, Whatever you want to call it, or is it something which people actually have learned? I think you can. Some people seem to have just a natural abundance of it, but I think you can learn it, and I think you can practice it. And then I think the work environment or the creation environment that we live in can foster it. So, even if you have only genetically a small amount of it, if you practice and if you put the right environment around someone, you know, I think just amazing, amazing things can can come from. People that don't necessarily go, well, I'm a, I'm a creative genius, but I have enough. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I bet you money that there's a, gut, a whole bunch of people who are currently watching this, who are asking themselves the question, oh my God, I would love to work at EA. Are you guys hiring? We're definitely hiring. Uh, so uh, you can always uh, go look at our job site, ea.com. And, um, but only people that want to have fun probably should apply. I think we find those people. Um, I want to bring us back to, uh, and probably as our last point here, um, you already talked a little bit about like, what you think the future holds in terms of gaming, in terms of like, different inputs which allow people to, be, uh, to interact with the game in different new ways. Um, what are your predictions for the, the future of gaming? Yeah. Future of gaming. Mm -hmm. I think I'll, you ask a lot of people today, are you a gamer? And they say no. Right. But, when I, but when I watch them, they have games on their mobile phones, they're interacting with people uh, digitally in ways that I would call gaming. So I think we're going to redefine what gaming means, which is interacting, connecting, and having fun uh, in, a, in a digital space. And instead of a few billion people gaming, we'll have, who knows, maybe the whole world will be gaming. Interesting. Fascinating. I want to ask you... Uh, Sorry, this is like a question out of left field. Okay. So just super I'm curious. Um, what's your favorite game? Oh, my favorite game, uh, that's easy. Um, so, uh, I started playing when I just started working with the company. And you, uh, I just love creating things. And mm -hmm. I love creating cities and having people have fun and uh, connect inside the city. So, yep, that's my favorite game. I remember SimCity. This has been around for a long time and has gone through a lot of iterations. Um, if I can take you on a journey, because like, you know, like this whole global summit is around like right. the future, right? If I can take you on a journey, like, and of course, don't spill anything you're working on. Um, but like, you know, 20 years out, like SimCity will probably be still be there, I'm pretty sure, because it's such a franchise. But like, how will SimCity look like? What do you envision? Like, are we using like augmented reality to build cities in our surroundings? Are we like rebuilding San Francisco while we're living in the city? We're assuming we'll have cities in the future. That's a good question. <laughs> I think that we'll, a uh, couple of things. I think people will be creating all kinds of environments, uh, not only just cities. So it will be maybe their home or maybe uh, other kinds of environments or transportation systems. So I think what 
is really fun to me about SimCity is the creation of a system um, that's serving some kind of a community. So I think it will branch in a lot of ways. Mm. So it could become environmental, it could be about architecture, it could be about plumbing, energy, and I think that it will be deeply social. Wow. So you'll be creating a community with people speak different languages from different parts of the world, and so you'll be building a kind of a global city. Fair, that, a, that would be very exponential, I think. That would be very exponential indeed. On that fantastic closing note, um, Andy, thank you so much for being here. Um, very quick uh, shout out to the Singularity Hub uh, uh, watchers. Uh, you heard there's jobs available. If you, you should definitely check out EA, uh, but only if you like to have fun. Um, Andy, thank you so much. It was fantastic to have you here today. Thanks, Pascal. Thank you. Welcome back to Singularity Hub, live from the show floor here at the Global Summit from Singularity University in San Francisco. So we talked about Internet of Things, we talked about gaming already, and I want to take us into space. Our next guest is truly, truly a pioneer in the industry, um, is currently working on helping humanity to become a multi-planetary species uh, with his startup uh, and company called Moon Express, and you're also the reason in a lot of ways why we're here. You were one of the uh, founding trustees of Singularity University. Um, so you and Peter and Ray and a, a few others have really put this together in the, in the very first place. Um, so Bob, I'm super psyched to have you here. And uh, we just briefly chatted um, when you came on stage. You just did a big announcement around getting us to the moon. Can you say a little bit more about like what is it you're doing and, and how you're achieving this? Sure, sure. Let me, let me say it's, just, it's great to be here in Singularity Hub. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan <laughs> and uh, very happy to be here and talk about a project that really has a origin coincident with Singularity University itself. Everything that's, we're talking about exponentials here at Singularity University, of course, and for some reason things that are our, our grand challenge level seemed to take about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's been 10 years since the first seeds of Singularity University sprouted. 
and it's been 10 years, uh, uh, just over 10 years, that I've been working on a vision to expand the economic sphere of Earth outward to the moon and beyond. And you know, we, we, live, uh, we live in a world that ultimately has finite resources, uh, stressed by, by societal forces, uh, that uh, uh, even with the application of exponential technologies that is going to radically improve the condition of life on this planet, this is still just the beginning for humanity. And we really need to expand as a multi-world species. And we live in a universe uh, so vast beyond human comprehension. We've only scratched the surface. We've only put human footprints down in our next world called the moon. Yeah. Back in the 60s, 40 or 50 years ago, we talk a lot about these, I'm going like this because we talk a yeah. lot about exponentials at Singular University. We are at the knee of the curve, not just about an explosion of exponential technology that will transform humanity, but a transformation of the species from the Earth into space, perhaps as profound as the emergence from life in the oceans to life in the land, mm. we as a species and all the other species of Earth are emerging from the surface of the Earth into the ocean of space. So to me, the first logical step is you look on the horizon if you're on an island, if you imagine the planet Earth on an island floating in space, and you look, if you're on an island looking to the horizon, where do you paddle? Where do you go? Well, if you see another island on the horizon, that's where you go. That's what the moon is, the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. It's a sister world within reach. Obviously, we've been there in the 60s, but now we need to utilize the moon and the resources we've recently discovered there as a, as a platform to learn how to become a multi-world species and to launch us to Mars and beyond. And Moon Express, the company that I founded with Naveen Jain and Barney Pell, two other people very familiar to Singularity University, uh, in 2010, We've, uh, we've just unveiled an architecture for robotic exploration that is going to do for lunar exploration what CubeSats did for exploration of Earth orbit. So not all our uh, viewers might be super familiar with like, the concept of CubeSats. Um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit more? Sure, because like, sure, I went like that, right? Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I know. Like, right. kind of like small, because yeah, totally. their satellites can be as, you know, half the size of this room. Right. And, and, and so... It, it, very, very similar to what, what happened in the computation world from main fr the mainframe era of computers. Mm -hmm. Things that were government-centric and filled a room were transformed into personal PCs that completely democratized access to computation. That's what's happening in space. We're moving from the era of a long-dominated world of government space, and we're democratizing access to space through a collapse of technology in many ways computation is transforming hardware into software. Mm -hmm. And it's expanding accessibility, so the costs are coming down, the, uh, the, the, the iterations are going up, and, uh, and, and the long tail of the market, meaning the rest of us, have access to space, and a small group of individuals, Moon Express I think is a great example, 50, 100 people, can do what only superpowers used to be able mm -hmm. to do, reach for another world, land on another planet. That's what's happening in space, and that's when I go like that for CubeSats. Yeah. That's the physical representation of the of what exponential technology does to collapse large hardware systems into small systems that, from a cost perspective, are much less expensive to launch into space than large systems. Wow, <laughs> that's a first for me. Thank you. <laughs> All that's right. what we call full service here. We do. Um, Can I have some more, please? <laughs> that's really fascinating. Um, you hit on something uh, in your earlier sentence around um, the economic aspect of us going to moon. So it's not just like us going to moon because it's what we should do or you know, because it's a nice postcard picture or you right. see Earth right. rising instead of moon rising. Right. But there's right. an economic point in there, right? And there has to be. Because yeah. we went to the moon, we as a human species, led right. by the United States, the superpower race between the Soviet Union and the United States, was about superpower politics. It was, a, it was about, uh, about political and psychological dominance. Mm -hmm. It was about proving that we were better than the other guy. And, and, we, and, and we planted flags with human species and, and walked around, but much faster than it took to get there. We abandoned the moon. It took us 10 years, which was remarkable, yeah. right? To go from nothing to landing on the humans on the moon. Yeah. And then within three years, we abandoned it. Between 1969 and 1972, only six people actually walked on the moon. We abandoned it. That's because the premise was we were in a race 
to prove supremacy. In the decades since, we've discovered that the moon isn't this, let me do this, this dry rock that we kind of thought it was in the 60s. It's actually a world with vast resources. Hmm. Um, the moon as a world was enriched through asteroid bombardment and its early formation, just like the Earth was enriched. Mm -hmm. So everything we mine on Earth, the platinum group metals, the nickel, the silver, iron, all of these things came from outer space. Mm -hmm. right? and the early, I'm going like this because it's the early yep. bombardment yep. of asteroids and meteorites in that molten Earth. And the moon was forming at the same time, but the moon, being a smaller body, cooled much faster. So what happened is everything that was enriching the Earth was also enriching the moon, but it was hitting a hard body. So it was either vaporizing or shattering right. and accumulating on the moon. So if you look up at the moon, what do you see mostly? What's the most kind prevalent like feature? Silvery surface and then like all the puck and puck marks, right? Craters. The craters. Every yeah. crater is a is a scar yeah. of an asteroid strike. Right. Right? So we have map the mineralogy of the moon probably better than we've mapped the mineralogy of Earth if you include the oceans. And there are vast resources there, but the most important discovery, which is only in the last 10 years of accumulating evidence, and then thanks to NASA in 2011, we have the steaming gun evidence that there's water on the moon. Hmm. That's a transformational subject. Right. Because water, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, um, is not only the stuff that supports life, but it's the stuff of rocket fuel. So hydrogen and oxygen form rocket fuel. It's transformational because the moon becomes a gas station in the sky, right? Uh, water is like the oil of the solar system. So that is the game changer, not just for the economics of all the resources on the moon, but the economics of getting anywhere else in the solar system. So if you take this a step further, like what is your like ideal vision of this future? Like, so you're bringing your stuff and, to moon, that's right. one step, right? Sure, so in, in the big picture, in the singularity realm, a future of abundance, where we're embracing the resources of the universe, uh, instead of fighting over crumbs in this little supermarket we call the Earth, the universe, the solar system, is, has practically infinite resources and energy, so we need to embrace the resources of space in order to be able to expand as a species. So that's the big picture, and for Moon Express, um, our long-term vision is to unlock the resources of the moon for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. so, so find out where those resources are, find out how to extract them and how to process them, store them and use them. In the short term, we're a transportation company. Mm -hmm. We are on the final stretch of, we hope, becoming the first private company to reach the moon within the next year. Something that only superpowers have done before. Yeah. With small robotic explorers that will open up and democratize access to the moon so we can learn more about it. And these will be stepping stones for a larger exploration and uh, resource searching on the moon. So that's the, like a commercial kind of like, for me is like a, a, like a mining operation type of thing. Harvesting. Harvesting, uh, right. Yes. What do you think yeah. is the, do you think, uh, you know, Richard Branson runs around and tells the world and, and sells tickets, right? For us to go into space adventure. Oh, when will we go? Yeah. Yeah, will, will this get, happen, right? When will like, we go? And when who, can you and I buy go? a ticket? Well, will we go? Oh, absolutely. Huh. So I used to, when I was a little boy, I used to think, boy, it would be cool to go into space, but I think I have to be a NASA astronaut and I have to work for the government, and it, it never happened. Now I can just go to Richard Branson and sure. put down, write a check that will hopefully clear and go to check, uh, go to space. So I'm a, I'm, I feel the same way about the moon. I believe that I, I could actually buy a ticket to go to the moon someday huh. in my lifetime, and, and the kids that are born today uh, it's, just, it's just a certainty in my mind for them. I think the generation of kids that are being born right now will look up in the next 10 years, look up at the moon and see lights mm. on the moon. Imagine seeing lights on the moon and, and, and how that will be a fundamental change to our human psychology yeah. to know that we're members of a spacefaring species. Absolutely. Right. So the first jobs will be a little tough. It'll probably be on the world's dirtiest jobs, but it'll be on the moon. <laughs> But uh, it will be a great place to go once you get a little, a few of the amenities that we yeah. like. Um, we'll redefine honeymoon. Uh, that's where you'll be able to go. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, that's what a moon is all about. Uh, Roma, and there'll be a lot of fun things to do in the moon. But it'll be practical because it'll be economic right. to be there as, as well as fun. It throws up interesting questions around like who owns it, like who owns moon. That's a, that's a, that's a great point. Right. And it's actually become, um, you know, you look at the risks of a startup enterprise, and uh, most startups have this, uh, you know, very common risks like money and 
resources and the right mm -hmm. people. Those are very common, whether you're doing a space or, a, or an app um, on an iPhone. So it turns out that in the 1960s, uh, during a, the Cold War era, if you can imagine, we were, we were locked in this struggle of potential nuclear annihilation in the Cold War and amassing tens of thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at each other. It was not the best time. And, 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 and technology to send things into space was just arising. So the, so the United States and the Soviet Union, as the primary parties in discussion, joined with other countries, got together and said, how are we going to behave in space? How do we, how do we prevent, let's say, a nuclear arms race in space? Let's not take our war in, how do we do this? So a document was developed and signed in 1967 called the Outer Space Treaty that has since been signed by over 100 nations that to this day governs the behavior of human society in space led by nation states. And it has uh, precepts that are quite grand. Um, uh, space is the province of all mankind. Uh, we shall put no weapons of mass destruction in space. We're not going to put military bases on the moon. We're going to, uh, the moon and all celestial bodies um, uh, are, 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 can, can, can be used by anybody, but also they can't be appropriated. So mm. it's got this, this, this tension between belief systems yep. that is open to interpretation by those signatories to that treaty. So the short answer is who owns the moon? Everyone and no one. Interesting. Right? So as the first private sector company to go there, um, we found ourselves in a situation in late 2015 where, um, you know, is there, uh, do you need a license to go to the moon? Can you right, just yeah. go to the moon? Right. And uh, so in order to get a commercial launch license to send a satellite into, into Earth orbit, there's a very standard routine process. It's managed by the Federal Aviation Administration. Mm -hmm. Every rocket that gets, commercial rocket that gets licensed to launch goes through this process. But all of that regulatory framework ends a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface. No private company has ever gone beyond Earth orbit. It's only been government spacecraft right. that have gone to other worlds. So when we uh, went to the State Department, which is the federal mm -hmm. body that interprets treaties and yep. uh, is responsible for the U.S. obligations under the Outer Space Treaty, and we said, hey, uh, we'd like to send some robots to the moon. Um, are you guys okay with that? <laughs> I mean, is uh, there any reason why that's a problem? And they, they said, uh, after some thought, they said, uh, well, we really support, in principle, what you want to do. We think it's great, but there's no way we could say yes to that. The reason is, there's no department. It's not that sure. the United States thinks it owns the moon. Yeah, it's yeah, because sure. in order to be compliant with its international right. obligations, it needs to have authorization and supervision. It has to know it's, there was no department of the moon. There was no regulatory framework. Yeah. Make a long story short, it took us almost a year to actually there was not even a process for the process. So we had to invent something out of thin air. We called it mission approval. And we went to the 10 or 12 federal agencies all involved in this process of approving things that go into space and, and, and developed this consensus that uh, has become a historic point in history. In, 20, in 2016, on July 20th, the U.S. government approved for the first time ever, actually in the world, a commercial entity to go beyond Earth orbit and to the moon, and that was Moon Express, setting some level of precedent that at least it's possible, but that conversation about how it's going to happen continuously is still moving. Wow. Yeah, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. It is a seriously exponential journey. Yes, huh. yes. On that note, on this ex truly exponential journey, um, I want to wrap it up. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great. I learned so much about the moon. I'm so excited to buy my ticket. Uh, to go to the moon, not just into orbit, but, but go to, to the, the moon. moon. All right. Uh, and I want to see your uh, harvesting operations uh, in full swing. I'll bring you back a piece of the moon. Fantastic. All Thank right. you so Great much. Great to see you. Thank you.
And we're back at Singularity Hub again from the show floor here at the Global Summit in San Francisco. Let me take you back from the moon where we had a very <laughs> excited conversation uh, and go back into the world of um, AI and technology in general. And I'm super, super, super stoked to have uh, Tracy Demiroz with us, who is the VP of Marketing at a super cool startup coming out of Stanford Research uh, Institute. Institute, is it Institute? Well, it's SRI now. It's not really associated with they're, Stanford they're anymore. They're only doing SRI? Okay. Yeah. So it comes out of, Stanford, S, out of SRI uh, called Casisto. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been working in this space for like 20 plus years, all your career, right? I have. I definitely, this is actually my second startup that spun out of SRI. And just for a little context, SRI is a world-renowned research institute, obviously. But uh, they have a decades, a treasure trove of decades of research and IP and artificial intelligence. So this is my uh, second startup that spun out of SRI. And Casisto was founded in 2013. And not only did we get that great treasure trove of AI, but the thing that we left uh, Casisto when we spun, or SRI when we spun out, was an enormous amount of uh, financial industry expertise that we trained this platform on. So we've created Kai Banking, it's a conversational AI platform, and it has very, very deep domain expertise, and we license it to financial institutions. So retail banks, wealth management firms, credit card companies license our technology and what they do is they build smart banking bots and virtual assistants for their customers to interact with. So to give you an example, um, we've licensed to companies or uh, financial institutions like Wells Fargo, MasterCard, and DBS uh, is a huge bank in Asia, and I think you might be interested in what they launched with our technology. We um, went to market with DBS in India, and uh, DBS created the very first mobile-only bank in India. So there's no branches, no signatures, uh, and it's a mobile bank. And so you can imagine um, our conversational AI platform is called Kai, and the Kai powered assistant in that mobile app is really the face of the bank. It's doing all of the heavy lifting and a lot of responsibility. And with the platform, DBS was able to extend it from a mobile app to Facebook Messenger and on the website. So their customers, every interaction is an AI driven conversation and language as natural as texting, you and I texting one yeah. another. And now the um, technology's been in market in India, Indonesia, and Singapore wow. for over a year and a half. And some of the um, real important KPIs coming out of there is that assistant is able to handle 82% of every customer's conversation, inquiry, and of course, no bot do we want to be 100%, right? right? There's instances where I want to talk to a human, for one sure. thing, but there's a seamless handoff to a live agent for the, the balance of the conversations. And I think just in terms of what AI is empowering companies to do is um, DBS was able to create this mobile-only digibank with one-fifth the resources of a traditional bank startup. Wow. That's huge. Let me let me ask you a little bit. So, if I understand Kai correctly, mm -hmm. your primary use case is uh, text-based direct interaction with a customer, correct? So that goes into this world of chatbots, which is chatbots really exploded over the right. last you know whatever eighteen months or so. Right. So there was like the chatbot build your chatbot kit and a lot of frameworks, a lot of noise. Right? Yeah. So. And I always found it interesting, like the question of like, do we see a world where like chatbots will become really meaningful? Like, can, you know, will they become our primary interface between us and our yeah. service providers, our apps, well, et cetera? Well, I have to say, the, your question's a good one because we do not see ourselves as a chatbot company. Gotcha. We really see chatbots as like one channel. And I think, you know, when Facebook launched, uh, launched Facebook Messenger and opened it up, there was a lot of hype around these chatbots and there was a lot of disappointment. And I think really the difference for us is um, a chatbot on a Facebook messaging platform is just one channel. We've created a platform that's like this AI brain 
that you are, with a lot of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised, feeding this AI brain, and then um, putting conversation as the user interface in a mobile app, on a website, or in Facebook Messenger. And so for us, Chatbot is one channel, and I think to your point too about this hype, there, anytime there's a category creation, there's a lot of um, high expectations, a lot of confusion, and a lot of kind of mystery of how consumers are going to interact with this and how they're going to adopt it. And one of the things that we really feel so strongly about for AI to have a really intelligent conversation, it has to have deep domain expertise. So for us, we've trained this conversational AI platform to know about transactions, to analyze your spending, and really what we're seeing banks shift from, from using this is not helping me move my money, like, oh Tracy, your mortgage is due, take this out of checking and go pay your mortgage, but really around uh, financial well-being, increasing um, with data-driven insights and actual, actionable recommendations tell me, um, you know, I, this money is sitting in your checking account, move it over to savings, or um, I see that you had an overdraft. Can I give you overdraft protection? But better than that, can I tell you in a week, you've got this bill due and you don't appear to have the balance to pay it. Fascinating. So, you just, something you said would trigger something in me. So you said like you're, you launched in India and you said it's in Indonesia and another country, right? And those are very uncommon languages we right. typically see in, in the AI space, right? Most of the AIs, the conversational AIs, right. at least I experience, are typically trained in English and like probably Spanish mm -hmm. and some European languages. Did you find any particular, like, was it difficult for you to do this? Was it just well, another data set? I, I have to say, because we do our, um, the company, I mean, we're B2B, right? Okay. So um, retail banks are licensing our platform and we are global. So taking Kai and training it in another language is something that, well with Indonesia, it's, uh, if you take DBS as an example, Kai, the Kai powered assistant and bot, can uh, converse in Basa Indonesia both in formal uh, language, slang, and then apparently there's this Uber slang version. Oh. And so, if you think about a bank, too, just in terms of, there's language segmentation, but there's also um, creating a persona might be different if I'm speaking to a retired person versus a millennial. And part of what we did in our platform, and we spent a lot of, um, really, for lack of a better word, ethical time thinking about it, is what kind of persona is in our platform. So, it really is an art and a science, and so we have um, AI UX experts, and, and their particular um, expertise and passion is in the written word, you know, literature and is their background. Coupled with our AI engineers, we created a persona that's genderless, and it really is, it's got a, um, an engaging personality, but it's not going to um, deep end on its favorite color, it's not going to let you flirt with it, it's going to stick, you know, re kind of direct you back to, let's do some banking. And you know, of course every bank that licenses us can, you know, personalize that persona into their own brand and voice. But with AI, it's, I think it's really important, um, this genderless, um, component is important to us as well as always making sure someone knows when they're talking to a human versus a machine. That brings up an interesting point. I was recently at um, Mozilla where you, we both we were worked. That, yeah. yeah. And um, they have a project around um, this idea that because the training sets for AIs are typically very uh, biased, mm -hmm. right? Like facial recognition AI is trained on white. Yep. Caucasian people, right? So an AI has problems detecting a person of color, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, voice recognition is trained on male voices right. with a specific accent very often, right? right? So you come in with like a deep south accent, 
and Alexa doesn't understand you anymore. Exactly. It sounds like you have done a lot of like in your in Kai's example, mm -hmm. you've done a lot of work to like overcome these biases. We have for sure, and it comes with the persona as part of our um, platform, and and we really you know AI, from for me personally, it's really moving from you know, NLU, a lack of a better, simplified, like I understood what Pascal said, but now I'm applying some reasoning to it, and I'm, I'm recommending an action, right? And so there is an element of trust that you build up with the bot that we feel is really important. And, and you see that all the tech giants, obviously, huge investments in AI right now, but, but really code of ethics and a unified manifesto. Um, I want to change tack a little bit. Okay. Um, you've been in this space forever, right? Yeah. Um, and you've seen, like, I was always so impressed because you always worked at companies which were at the forefront of, you know, what's happening in a particular industry. Um, outside of Kai, obviously, and like right. AI, I guess. What are you super excited about at the moment in terms of technology? I have to say, I, I'm super excited, and, and it is self-serving to say AI, but I am super excited for more experiences that are context contextual, predictive, and personalized in everything I touch. And part of it, I have to say, um, is I think a pendulum swinging of our attention span. We are just consumed by our screens, right, and our smartphones. and. I really am excited for a more balance of um, not necessarily notifications per se, but getting information when I need it and when I want it. Um, and just, I, I'm super excited about how AI can create these contextual uh, experiences. So, do you think AI will pull us out of the, the our seemingly over reliance or over absorption of? of content and devices? Do you think it pulls us out and allows us to be more I, like, I have to in the say, real world again? I hope so. And I have to say, in part of uh, singularity, too, of the premise of um, AI and technology elevating us to higher thinking. And I, I mean, I'm an optimist. <laughs> Otherwise, Clearly. I wouldn't be in so many startups. Clearly. And be, you know, and a mentor at singularity. Yeah. I really am an optimist for that. And, it is, and I'm speaking personally when I'm saying I personally would like less um, yeah. Consumption. So, what do you think is, is in terms of um, in technology, a particular technology or a particular technology trend, is going to be super disruptive to our lives? Yes. I mean, AI for sure, clearly. Yes. But what else is like, you know, on your horizon? What do you scan at the moment? Where's your next startup? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, the company that blows my mind right now is Amazon. I am just blown away by Amazon. You mean the bookseller? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just in terms of, uh, I have to say the execution is yeah. flawless too. I mean, yeah. I definitely keep an eye. On Why is that particularly? I mean, I'm also a really big fan of Amazon and somewhat they creep me out because they're like everywhere. Right. And when you talk, we talk a lot to uh, Fortune 500 CEOs and you know, like people who run businesses. And well, they enter good... and they disrupt I and know. they create. There's a good chunk of people who are really scared of them, for sure. And the, eco the ecosystem that they create is phenomenal. Yeah. It really, you know, just everything they touch. Prime, AWS, just. Right. No, so I, I'm fascinated by them in terms of. But I, I have to say, um, I do feel like from an AI point of view, there is just this. Um, coming together of pieces that we've had and it's an exciting time right now for sure. Yeah, it really feels like a lot of the disparate pieces we had lying around right. now start to merge and emerge and come together and like create a really interesting new unified whole. For right? sure. And like for me uh, with Ecosisto in the finance industry, which you know working with banks and legacy systems and highly regulated and compliance and privacy and to see that industry embracing the AI, not just for you know fraud detection and compliance and back end things, but really along their customer journeys. And, in cre and I really do believe they are shifting from helping people move their money to manage their money. So let me end with one last question. I'm curious, okay. um, and I want to stay in AI. Like yeah. in, the, in the realm of AI, 
where are we like in terms of like is this day one is I mean, like week one you know like well I, I have to say I just being in the industry so long I do I worked at one startup where we had this vision of these agents and the use case we always talked about is putting an agent it wasn't called the cloud then but putting an agent up there that would the uh, story was a wedding anniversary and go up there and you know this sounds so stereotypical and dated but make a restaurant reservation and buy flowers and what have you and these agents would Still do it. and so to me I've been that was 20 years ago um, I, now I think the rate of acceleration and uh, what you can do with so much less in terms of computing power and, and AI machine learning I think we're gonna see it all right, so uh, I'm done with the wedding thing. I'm, I'm already <laughs> happily married, um, but I'm sure like that agent. Fabulous Adrian, person. I know <laughs> that agent can do me uh, a huge favor and organize my, my wedding years anniversary. Ago, really, right? that we were talking about these things. I know, right. Um, on that note, uh, it was my distinct pleasure to have you here, Tracy. Oh, thanks, um, it was super fun geeking out with you on AI. Uh, we'll be back soon with more content. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Anita Scholl-Breda. Anita is the CEO and co-founder of Iris AI. It's a startup that Fast Company recently named one of the most innovative artificial intelligence startups of 2017. She's recently also been named faculty at Singular University of Denmark, and she's an alumni of the 2015 Graduate Solutions Program. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about Iris AI. It's been yep. so exciting following the growth of the company. Tell me about a bit about the application of the AI system. Right, so our, our ultimate goal is to build an AI researcher. And we're kind of of the core belief that if one human being could sit down and read every single research paper, every single patent in the world, just read them all in one go, connect the dots, we'd be able to solve a lot of problems. You know, we mm -hmm. have a lot of knowledge, it's just inaccessible. Um, so ultimately what we're doing is building an AI that can read and understand and connect the dots in all of it uh, for us. Um, but obviously zooming that back into today, which is what really matters, right? What is, it, what is it that we're building now is a tool for R and D research institutes, entrepreneurs with, with kind of big hairy problems to solve where yeah. you need to apply research and science to solve it. Uh, and we're semi automating the process of mapping out what you should read to solve the problem or to, to see what research you need to do to solve the problem. So it's um, basically you start with a problem statement, take that problem statement, give it to the tool to read. You can write out in so your you can, own like, words. You can copy and paste it or write exactly. it into the system. Exactly. So in your own words, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Give that to the system to read and we map out in a visual format what, what research is relevant to, uh, to the challenge that you're, you're solving. It's amazing. And so Iris AI in many ways is about transparency of research. And so right now in technology, sometimes there's tension of technology and transparency. Sometimes it feels like oil and water. Other times with open source trends, right. it feels very homogenous. So what are your thoughts on transparency and technology? So I think, I mean, we're in, in an interesting spot, right? Because we're both in the kind of the tech where you talk about open source and do you, you know, do you keep things a trade secret? Do you, do you patent your software or do you, do you publish all the code, right? And then we're also operating in the science field where paywall content and open access uh, research papers are kind of in the same kind of, what do you do, right? Do you pay to publish it openly so that anyone can access it? Um, and we very much fall on the side of openness and transparency, where we're firm believers in that, um, especially when it comes to science. We believe that it, it should be open, it should be publicly available, especially the, the science that has been paid for by our tax money yeah. should be openly and freely available. Um, now, we, we are not in a position right now to do much about that, but at le the least we can do and, and what we're working on is making sure that you can at least find the right research, you know. And then we'll see, you know, the open access movement is flourishing. More and more papers are published open access. Then you have, you know, archive and, and everything that's being kind of pre-published there. So you have this, this movement of openness, especially in areas of exponential tech, where there is just more and more openness. So, so we're firm believers of that. Uh, we think that if we want to get humanity you know, to the next level, we have to, as we say, and sorry for swearing, science the shit out of it. Um, and, you know, if you, you know, if you want to do that, you have to have it openly. You know, it doesn't help to have lots of knowledge if it's all hidden behind paywalls. Completely. And so this open access, was this part of the inspiration of founding Iris AI? So there was a number of things. I mean, we, we sat down and looked at the 10 to the 9th challenge, like how can yeah. we positively impact the world? And, and we looked at, you know, we ended up stumbling into the kind of the academic publishing industry and looked at it from a number of different angles, mm -hmm. right? There's so many things that are problematic with it. You know, paywall content is one of them. Um, the system for scoring points when you publish papers is one yeah. of them. So like, the, you know, it's, it's better to split up a, a research project in two papers rather than publish it all in one because you'll score more points. There's just a number of things. The citation system is one of the things where, where we saw that you know, most existing tools to navigate the research world or, or search engines, if you like, is based on the citation system that has some merit, but when it comes to finding solutions to your problems, that you know, the citation system works more as a popularity index, and I know that's simplifying it, but yeah. you know, so, so we just believe that um, you know, by, by, um, th there's a number of issues with the whole industry, and, yeah. and open access was one of the trends that we saw, and we're like, okay, well, as more and more research is becoming open, how do we find it, right? Yeah, and so is there an example of um, positive impact that the system has been able to make or just an interesting use case that you love talking about? So, so we have a couple. So one of them, which is very much tied to the industry. So we're focusing in on material sciences to start, material science to start with. It's just a good field uh, to begin with. It's cross-disciplinary by nature. Uh, one of the challenges we've worked on with, with one of our, our partners 
is can you build a reusable rocket out of composite materials, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways we prove that the tool worked. We had multiple teams compete against each other to solve that challenge. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. And one of the teams was using an old school search engine. Um, their conclusion at the end of five hours was, nope, we can't do this. Technology isn't there. The team that used our tool, um, you know, they concluded it was possible. They wow. outlined three key papers and how it could be done. And, and said it was going to be really expensive, but uh, it was possible. So that was, that was very exciting. Um, it's exciting to see how um, artificial intelligence systems can extend human intelligence. Definitely. And I think so, I want to ask you, zooming out, looking at the industry and the yep. technology of artificial intelligence, in many ways it's under heat, hype and heat. Very much so. What kind of responsibility do you think AI researchers, people developing it, have to ensure they're making systems that are going to propel humanity forward for the better? Because we see these news headlines that feel extremely dystopian. Yes. What are your thoughts? So I think it's important to kind of see the, the big difference between like 25 plus years into the future and like zooming back into today, which is always, and you see a lot of startups that have these like, and we do the same, right? We have this big vision, we're going to build an AI researcher, but that is still 10 years into the future, right? So what are we doing today? And I think it's the same when it comes to the, the ethical responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, sure, we can have the discussions on like utopia, dystopia, you know, uh, are we building Skynet, which is the simplified version <laughs> of it. And I think that is too much of a, you know, hype headline that is really easy to latch on to. I think the more pressing issues is already today, like what data sets are you using to build your algorithms, right? And you have a ton of examples on like beauty page pageants online, right? Which uses all pictures of white women, white right. skinny women to judge beauty, right? And mm -hmm. then so if anyone who doesn't look like that uploads, um, you know, uploads their picture to see if they're beautiful, they're not, right? Because the data set you picked isn't the right one. You have a mm -hmm. police department in Florida that, you know, did racial profiling in their, yeah. in their algorithm to, you know, to assess. So I think that's, you know, today that is where, you know, a lot of the a lot of the responsibility lies, like what data are we using? Mm -hmm. How are we making sure that we don't build in our own biases right. into the system? And I'm far more concerned about that. As more and more automated systems comes into our everyday lives, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that we don't, you know, keep, I mean, because we are living in a society that is incre incredibly discriminating against a number of different minorities. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we don't build that into our systems? Because then suddenly also we remove ourselves. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't me, it was a computer well, system, right? I didn't, right? Do, it. I didn't yeah. do it. But but we do because we build it into our systems. Right? It's amazing hearing that in your methodology because, you know, we saw the huge article that came out, artificial intelligence has a white guy problem about how it's being exactly. built. So this is, it's critical to be addressing it now. Yep. So with Iris AI, right now it works in tandem with someone yep. inputting a question. Do you one day see Iris AI totally autonomous as just a machine not working in collaboration with a human? So so more and more so. Um, but I think, I mean, so, so today it's very much in collaboration. It's an iterative process going from a problem statement, zooming out to find a bunch of research. Next steps that we're launching this fall is focusing back in to figure out it's the, the geeky term is a semi-automation of the systematic landscape mapping. But uh, anyway, it's focusing in, and there's, that's very much an iterative process, right? And Iris makes some assumptions, asks the users about the assumptions, mm -hmm. and we build it together. Um, if you look further into the future, there's going to be more and more autonomy, right? Iris mm -hmm. can extract a hypothesis from a paper, see all of the hypotheses in connection in a similarity graph, build new hypotheses on the top of existing, and then actually go test them in a, in a simulation environment mm -hmm. or robotic lab. And at that point, you're looking at more autonomy. Right. But, you know, so, so yes, but on the other hand, it will never, you know, never say never. But, like, our goal isn't to, like, press play and then Iris solves all of the problems in the world. Like, humanity in the world is complex, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we always are going to need some level of human human involvement. Although that we have this, if we talk way beyond what we give as a standard pitch, um, you know, when Iris is able to figure out science and, and you know, mm -hmm. find science, find the right theories, you know, extract mm -hmm. the hypothesis, etc., we can actually connect Iris to other AIs and teach them science. And at, and at that point, we're starting to see less and less, you know, yeah. human involvement. So as with anything, right now it requires a lot of manual time. The next version will reduce the manual labor with about 90% for that part wow. of the process. Um, so, yes, we do fall into the category of tools that reduce, reduce labor time. Yeah. When you talk about Iris um, AI being able to one day speak with other AI systems, I get the her image where Samantha starts communicating with all the other systems. Right. I don't, I don't think Iris will ever be like friendly and pleasant. It's, it's, it's a researcher, you know, we, you know, get the job done.
What questions are hot on your mind about AI research or AI in general? Um, right now, it's about the hype. Yeah. Right? It's like, are we doing ourselves, a dis and, and it's a personal question too, right? So we started the company two years ago and we present ourselves as an AI company, yeah. right? Iris.ai, like it's in our domain and our name. So the question is, are we doing ourselves and the world a disservice by like positioning everything as AI, right? It's like AI for dog walking, right? AI for this, AI yeah. for that. And we're like, are we, are we hyping it too much mm -hmm. so that we end up overhyping it because people are very excited about AI these days and I get right. that and there's plenty of things we can do that are super exciting but then there's also the fact that like we're not quite there yet right, right. there's still a lot of development we can do the little things really well mm -hmm. but like the, the big vision the crazy future is still years away right yeah. so I think that's one of my concerns that we're that we're overhyping it and I've you know started more and more you know stop talking about us as an AI company only but mm -hmm. like we're a company that solves important problems for R&D yeah, and you guys just won here the Global Grand Challenge for yes. Learning. Congratulations. Thank you. It's very exciting. And I can see how you are a learning organization as well, and so that would be one way also to position the platform. Yeah, exactly. And we do fall into we do fall into the learning ed tech space, obviously with people who are, you know, um, not necessarily highly educated. One of the effects actually that we're seeing from our platform is that it, it does to a certain degree de skill. Um, the, the users or the requirements on the user like you don't mm -hmm. need to be a professor to you know map out the yeah. science uh, as in some instances if you do this manually you have to have kind of at least a, an associate professor mm -hmm. degree or level to be able to do the full rigorous manual process mm -hmm. while with our tool we de-skill it but still we're not you know we're not a, a kindergarten tool uh, you, do, yeah. you do need to know a little bit about science or research or the field right. you're working in. But it's exciting. Imagine a teacher putting it to work with their class on their research. I remember when we were in school going through encyclopedia pages and yeah. how much it slowed things down. Yeah. So you are a female founder. There's also a bunch of hype, misconception stories about this experience. What have been any misconceptions that you have encountered as a female founder? Um, you know, I think I think for me the the, the thing that kind of messes with my head is like I, I don't think of myself as like a female founder. Yeah. Like I'm a founder. I have a company to run, I have technology to build, we have a product to sell. Like my day to day life isn't about being female. My yeah. day to day life <laughs> is about running a startup company and, and succeeding. And, and and so that's why it's always like whenever I'm like, oh like, you know, I I won an award for like, you know, um, inspiring fifty, women in tech. And I'm like, oh right, I'm a woman in tech. Like, right, I forgot about that. I think it's, we don't go around thinking about the fact that like our bodies or our, our gen genetics are the way, like it, it just is, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just happen to be female. And, and so for me, that's the biggest misconception. Like I, this is not something that's on my mind. While having, of course, been in situations where like I've gotten the like older male engineer like patting me on the head and laughing like, at me Thank as you. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> yes, th I've been there, but that's not. That's not my day-to-day -day business. Yeah, and it's not stopping your game either. You are... No, no and of course, and, and it, it is sad to see like what's going on in Silicon Valley and, and like the, 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 the limited amount of female partners I meet and the VCs mm -hmm. I pitch to. And of course, there is the question in the back of my head, like, am I being you know judged unfairly? Because again, when we talked about the biases in our algorithms, yeah. it's the same thing. And we're not, we're not aware of our biases, right? So there is this little voice every now and then that goes like, is this affecting our fundraising? Mm -hmm. Sh you know, should I put one of my male co-founders? Like, probably not, because like I am, I am the CEO of this company. That's who they want to see. Yeah. Still, like, there's always the question: like, is this impacting our fundraising? On the other hand, again, I have a company to run. Yeah. And so, what is fueling you often with pushing all your work forward personally and with Iris AI? <laughs> it's a good question. I just, I just really like what I do. Like, I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of passion. I just really want to make something that matters. You yeah. know, I want to, I love seeing like examples of our technology put to good use. We have another, I mentioned earlier, we had a couple of different case studies that I really like. One, another one is this tiny little chocolate factory, West Coast US, uh, who's like, he wanted to build a sustainable product line, right? New product line, sustainable, um, healthier chocolate. He's like, but I, I don't have an R&D department, you know? Mm. And he stumbled across our tool and used that to build a new product line. And he was like basically R&D enabling himself, not wow. being highly skilled, not being a researcher, 
but not having tons of resources. Exactly, but using our free tool that is available on our website to do an R&D process, you know, and, and basically R&D en enabling himself. And things like that really gets me going, where I'm like, we're doing something that actually matters to people, that people are excited about. Um, so yeah. that's, that's kind of what keeps me, keeps me going. And then, I don't know, I've never had a real job. You know, I, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what it looks like. I'm just really enjoying the freedom and flexibility and hard work and like yeah. seeing things grow from literally nothing and then seeing what we built. Yeah, well, I've been following you guys for the past two years, and you are doing something that matters. So thank you so much, Anita. Thank you so Super, much. Super, really big pleasure. That's it.